get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have one of the top fitness professionals. Elliot Hulse is a strength coach, pro strongman, owner of the world-renowned strength camp in St. Petersburg, Florida. His YouTube channels have over 1.3 million subscribers who tune in for education, inspiration, and becoming the strongest version of ourselves. Elliot, thanks for joining me. Pleasure to be here with you, Jeremy. I'm excited. You know, I have a lot of good questions for you. And one that comes up, I saw the the post on Twitter where you said, what should I give a 20-minute TED Talk about? And... From you, from the theme of what you talk about, mental toughness seems to kind of span everything. So I wanted to have you talk about what mentally does it take to be a a pro strongman? Oh, see, mental toughness is one of these things where it's like the harder you go, the less you get. It's Mm -hmm. almost like you've got to turn your brain off. So mental toughness is actually mental disconnect Mm -hmm. because like when you're I I remember I've got this one video where I'm pulling like a 400 pound sled and in order to get the body to do what you want it to do you literally have to turn your brain off so it becomes mental shut off Mm. you know and sometimes I think that's beneficial in training of course if you're gonna do straw man you can't think about the pain you're experiencing right Mm -hmm. now Mm -hmm. you just do it (laughs) and and I think that happens also with entrepreneurship and and other aspects of our lives where you just don't have time to think about the pain right now. You just do it. So t- toughness is more of, a, more of a yielding rather than an attacking mm-hmm. in, in my mind. Mm-hmm. So how do you turn your brain off then in that situation and not think about the pain you're going through? One of the best ways, <laughs> well, when you're dragging 400 pounds, one of the best ways to do that is just start screaming. Because when you allow your body to express the pain, mm-hmm. you don't have to think about it. And oftentimes your body is a lot stronger than your mind gives it credit for. So you let the body do whatever the body wants to do. And oftentimes when you're under that amount of physical duress, it's Arr! a lot of screaming. That's why even, you know, you, if you watch like uh, Bruce Lee and, and all the noise he makes when he's knocking people out, mm-hmm. that's because he ain't thinking too much right now. His body is responding. And, uh, and there's a lot of noise to be made when your body's working that hard. Yeah. yeah. What about in the football days? When you were in co- playing college football, what would you do per- to prepare? I think one of the most mentally grueling uh, aspects of football and positions in football is the, is the guy on the kickoff team that's supposed to get there first and break the wedge, called mm-hmm. the wedge breaker, mm-hmm. the suicide guy. And, uh, and that was me. <laughs> so <laughs> you're the when you go, guy. you're running full speed downhill and you've got these, you know, a bunch of 250 pound guys, you literally have to know that you're going to destroy them like a heat sinking missile. Right. You can't think about what might happen. You can't have a strategy. You don't have a back door or a plan B, you have, I'm going straight through you, and that's it. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it's, a, it, it's, again, it's one of these ideas where you should not be thinking. Single, single-minded focus. Mm-hmm. I wish I would see a video of you with a GoPro on in those days. <laughs> if you just, <laughs> on the attack. Yeah, you got to commit, and, and um, you can't be afraid to die. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds you know self-preservation is a big part of what gets us in trouble it's a matter of like i might break my neck but i don't care you, know, you got to be a bit of a masochist to, <laughs> to treat your body that way i guess that's why in my older age now i'm doing more yoga <laughs> <laughs> um what about after the the biceps injury when you, cause that's also another different type of mental toughness to get over. Like when something, someone experiences an injury or something happens to get back. Cause you're again, like you're, 
everything's kind of built around fitness. And when you can't do that thing you love, whether it's fitness or something else, how do you mentally psych yourself up after an injury or during an injury? You know, my athletic career and entrepreneurship, my life in general, I think that the the take home lesson when I pass from this body is how to yield and how to how to take lessons from the debilitating injuries and experiences right. that I have. So, you know, I, I tore my bicep and what it really taught me was you're not invincible, Elliot. Hmm. You know, you, you can break. And instead of approaching it like, you know, you know I, I tore my bicep, how quickly could I get back? I really spent several months, I, I had a complete personal transformation, but since several months and years uh, afterwards, really trying to cultivate a more resourceful character for longevity in life and career. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, again, you know, maybe it's not a great thing that I wanted to blow people up in my <laughs> pursuit for the for the ball carrier but uh but given the experiences that I've had with that type of attitude uh I'm grateful for the lessons learned yeah yeah and uh, yeah. and, and war- we often speak of warriorship but there's also an immature aspect of the warrior called heroship and uh, and the mature the, the warrior is a mature version of the hero. The hero thinks nothing can stop him. The hero thinks he can do everything. And it's a very pleasing idea to the ego. You can be whatever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. Nobody could stop you. But the truth is that that's not true. That you are a human being. You do have limitations. You know? So that's what I've been learning. Yeah. I like that approach. So instead of seeing it as a negative or how to mentally psych yourself, you see whatever the big lesson you're supposed to learn in that particular phase or whatever is going on. Um, so what do you tell your kids then? You know, um, they say, cause there, there's a, a dynamic there of you want them to be able to see there is no limit. They could do whatever they want, but in reality there are, are some limitations like you're saying. So, so what, yeah. how do you transmit that with, with teaching your kids or, or with what the, your kids say? Cause I know you have four, four lovely kids. You know, um, since since our first child, my wife and I would often look at them when they're infants, and then we watch them when they're a little bit older, they get a little bit older, and we keep we're just scratching our heads and saying, I wonder what you're going to be like. Mm-hmm. And, we, and we, come, we talk about it, because I think it's, with children, it's more of a matter of seeing what they'll become and what their strengths are, rather than making them be something or giving them something to aspire to. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't really give my children any... Uh, any aspiration or any demand for who they should become I'm just far more interested in what in creating an environment where they're exposed to things that I think are healthful to them but really just sitting back and wondering like what are you going to be and that's why I say become the strongest version of yourself because that's very subjective you're going to become one thing you can become is the best you right and that's really all I'm interested in yeah and the best you might not be an astronaut and that's okay <laughs> right yeah. <laughs> and Ellie, when I was looking at, at things, you know, one of the most impressive things that dwarfs everything, in my opinion, if you said, Jeremy, I have 10 million YouTube subscribers, I'm like, that's nothing compared to this one thing that you've done. Or I have 20 YouTube subscribers. One of the most impressive things that dwarfs everything is you've been dating your wife since she was 14. Mm hmm. And therein lies the key. You said it. I've been dating her since we were 14. And it's been 20 some odd years. I guess that would make us, yeah, we're about 21 years married, I think. And uh, that makes sense. That don't make no damn sense. You see, she puts up with me. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is I still date her. It's like we're still, it's, we're yeah. still kids. We go on dates every week. I'm still smitten with her. We still act like we did when we were 16. And I think that's a, that's a big part of what has allowed that to happen is that we keep allowing ourselves to fall back in love with each other by doing things that people who love each other do. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people say they fell out of love. And I'm like, well, you didn't fall out of love. You just stopped doing the things that people love each other do. So how do you keep the spark alive? What do you do? 
do things that people who love each other do. Like I grab her ass all day long and kiss her on her <laughs> neck from behind. We go on dates and have dinner and, and we, we talk and we do fun things that you did. See, before life takes over, you know, yeah. when you're a teenager and you're, or you're in your 20s and, and, and you have a new girlfriend, you do all these really cool things together because right. that's what you know, young people do when they're in love. But that doesn't have to stop. And it doesn't have to stop when things are, are challenging either. Our first date night was with a hero, with a, with a meatball hero and a, and a six pack on the beach. I mean, we didn't have much money. Now we go to Nance restaurants and stuff. She gets all dressed up and dazzly for me. But, um, but you know, we always just made it a point to do the things that we did when we were in love. It's like the habit. You know, mm-hmm, you just mm-hmm. maintain the habit. You just keep doing the things that people in love do and, you, and, the, and the spark stays lit. Yeah. So, Elliot, with um, what's Colleen's influence been on your work life? Because obviously she has a huge influence on you throughout the years and different transitions. Oh, if I could describe her in one word, I'd say ground. She is my ground. She, is, she keeps me grounded. You know, if I didn't, I think because I'm, I'm, I'm that, that same rocket we spoke about, like just my attitude is that rocket, go, go, go. If I didn't have the weight of a wife and four children, I would have <laughs> left the earth already. <laughs> <laughs> so she just has always been there to ground me. She yeah. calls me my bullshit. She's the first one to call me my bullshit and the first one to praise me when I'm doing the right mm-hmm. thing. I can always go to her for completely, as, as objective as someone who loves you deeply, feedback mm-hmm. and uh and to this day i mean she's my she's my earth so what's something she she's called you on lately well I, i'll tell you one that was uh, my friends still joke with me about um you know i make these videos where i talk about you know life mastery and being the strongest version of yourself right. and uh i competed in a strongman event a few years ago and, uh, you know, I was tired at the end of the event. I knew I wasn't going to win. The, the, the event was lagging on. It was late at night, and they did the award assembly. And I'm used to taking first place, but I knew I wasn't taking first place at this one. So I was like, I'm going to leave. I'm just, I, I, don't, I don't even want to stay for the award assembly. You could keep the freaking second place trophy. You know, I can just get the fuck out of here. And she, she goes, is that what the strongest version of you would do? Mm. <laughs> and my friends were there, so they... They were just like, ooh. <laughs> Actually, they're my friends now, but at the time they were my students. They were, they were training at my gym. Right. And they were like, wow, Elliot, who we all aspire to and look up to, just got put in his place <laughs> by Kali. <laughs> and, uh, and they still make that, they still tell us that joke. So I like that one. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. I was watching one of your videos too. Elliot about and I was surprised about this one actually it was the pro-am show in Orlando and you said I've never been so nervous even with football or whatever it was I'm curious why were you so nervous for that particular do you remember what I'm talking about that particular show in Orlando where I think you won the Mm -hmm. won it or you got your pro strongman Um, do you remember why you were so nervous for that in particular Anybody who's played team sports, there's a sort of camaraderie associated with training together and having a, a, a team goal. You know, we're, we're all banding together for this one objective. And I played team sports my whole life. Yeah. Strongman is an individual sport. So like with team sports, it's a matter of does everybody do their job? I, I did my job. You did your job. With sports like wrestling or powerlifting, Olympic lifting, strongman, it's you and it's only you and you can't defer to anyone or anything. And I think that was the first time I competed in that way where it was, hey, you're on the line and that's it. So that may have been part of the reason. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk about early on, you had a lot of big influences um, with your family. Um, What's some of the best advice? And I know your uncle was very influential early on. Mm-hmm. What's some of the best advice your your uncle gave you early on? Well, not so much advice, but habits. And he taught me the habit of eating right for bodybuilding and performance. He taught me the habit of exercising and using weights to train. He taught me the habit of keeping a journal 
keeping a training journal, nutrition journal, life journal. He taught me the habit of meditating. So these are all things that, uh, that he taught me to do. Yeah. And so what about with your parents? Oh, my dad is full of them. <laughs> I, could probably, I could probably do an entire show on, on, the, on the things my dad has said. But one of the things that he used to say, and uh, believe it or not, right, he's, he's really like in your face with his advice. So you see where I get it from. And he used to say things to me when I was a kid. And of course, you know, that which you are or, or reflects your character, you kind of shy away from. And I, I couldn't stand my dad because he was so in your face. Now as an adult, I look back and I'm like, yeah, he was right. <laughs> uh, one of the things he, he used to say, uh, and we kind of alluded to it before, is you can't be whatever you want to be. Mm. <laughs> and I, you know, nobody wants to hear that, especially you know, a fiery young kid who... You know, I, I want to prove to you that I can do anything. Right. And he'd be like, no, you can't be whatever you want to be. Hmm. You're going to be who you're going to be. You're going to be, and that's where I probably got the idea. You could do the best that you could do, but you can't be everything. And you can't be whatever you want to be. And I was like, harsh. But I think the best piece that he gave me was, if you get up every day and work, you will never have anything to worry about. He says, you just get up every day and work. It does not matter what you, is going on. You get up and you do your work. Don't worry about if you're going to be okay. Don't worry if you're going to make enough money. Don't worry about if you're going to have a roof over your head. Don't mm -hmm. worry. Just work. Yeah. What did he do? He uh, worked on, auto, on cars, auto body. Nice. So I want to hear about some of the, the early days of your career. Um, Joe Pugliano, how does he influence you? Hey, how do you know Joe Pugliano? I just did research. Oh, okay. <laughs> Joe was uh, one of my first clients. So how did that's he influence your, your career? Oh, that's interesting. How did Joe influence my career? Well, Joe was one of my first clients at uh, Lifestyle Family Fitness, which was a, uh, a fitness gym where I first started training when I moved to Florida. And when I left to start my own business, he was like one of the only guys that came with me you know, I thought you know here I am like thinking I'm hot shit and like all my clients are gonna leave with me and I'm gonna start my own business and I could do anything <laughs> that one I proved my dad wrong I was like I can't do this <laughs> and uh, and he, he like everybody dissed me and he was like one of the only ones to come and here I am with a uh, family I don't think I think we had Isabel at the time mm -hmm. we just bought a house because you know that's when they were giving mortgages away to anybody with a heartbeat. And <laughs> uh, he pays me for the, for the three months of training, and I took that money and I bought, bought my first laptop computer. And that laptop is where I learned internet marketing that allows me to do all the things that I do today. So, I mean, this was an old school laptop where... I don't know if you remember, but you have to put a card in it so yeah. they can get the internet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like one of those big plastic. Ethernet plastic cards. Yes. Yep. So that's yeah, that's no, he was influential for sure. So what so he went with you from your first gym where you worked at a gym, and then what was the next? What'd you do after you left that gym? Uh I I bounced around from gym to gym, but ultimately ended up training people out of the back of my van uh, in parks with weights that I basically made. They were homemade sandbags, mm. tire sleds. I literally drove around the city picking up used tires um, and, and various other odd objects of this sort. And I put them in the back of the van that my dad gave me. And this was way before like boot camps. I'm dating myself now. And I called it strength camp. And I was like, well, I don't have a gym, but I'm going to train people with weights yeah. instead of having them bounce around like they do at boot camps. I'm going to have them lift weights, but we're going to do it in the park. And I would, I would lug a th over 1,000 pounds of weight wow. around the city, open up my door, take it all out, train people, and call it strength camp. And that's where my business started. So what was after the 1988 Ford van? <laughs> uh, we uh, decided to get a warehouse, uh, just a little garage. I paid $900 a month for. I paid the first two months on credit card, and I threw all my garbage in that 
that warehouse and uh, and started training my clients out of there. Yeah, and yeah. so what were the type of clients you were training? I was training mostly athletes and their dads. Mm -hmm. Like, and we still have this to this day, where you know a dad will bring his daughter in or his son, or his son and they'll watch us working out with them, and they'll be like, "Oh, you know, I used to be a pretty good basketball player <laughs> back in my day. I used to. Hey, what? Why don't I give that a try?" And then it's like, "All right, wait a second. You got to sign a waiver, buddy." And they, they want to try the exercises. The next thing you know, they're like, "How do I sign up? Can I?" And I do this too, so yeah, that, that's how that evolved. Yeah, because I was reading you train anyone from millionaires to poor teenage football players is what it said. Yes. And that's... so, what was the environment like of where your warehouse was? Dan Kennedy, who, who was one of my marketing mentors, I read a lot of his books. Said mm -hmm. if you can't, he said something to the effect: if you in your marketing and in your service, if you can't fix it, feature it. Which basically means like where your business sucks, just point it out. And it was dirty and we had very little space so we'd have to go outside all the time. And if it rained, you got wet. So a fitness gym where you're going to get dirty, you're going to get wet when it rains mm -hmm. and that's it. We're going to train with trash. There's no cozy equipment. There's just used garbage and... And, uh, and a dusty warehouse, and that's what you get. Yeah, I love it. I love that visual. And then, you you know, I was reading too, to keep the lights on, you did, you used your internet marketing efforts during that time. What did you yeah. do? Well, in order, so when you work, anybody in sales knows this, when you work for an organization that has a product or a service, uh, even if you're rendering the service, they provide you with leads. Yeah. So working at a fitness gym, you're, I got a lot of sales experience because I was just fed leads, 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 right. leads, leads, which is great. I learned how to close a, close a sale, which anybody in business should know how to close a sale. Um, but when I left, I had no more leads. You know, the lead machine dried up. So I had to learn how to market. Yeah. That's why I got the laptop computer and I started mm -hmm. uh, studying internet marketing. I mean, this was back when my Corey Riddell <laughs> if you remember, sure, yeah, man. Yeah. Back then, so I was listening to audios and and uh, they send those binders, audios, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, big old DVD by a uh, CD binder. Not like now we have podcasts and stuff, but back then it was like, yeah, hey, you have to like put the CDs in. And, boy, so I remember studying that stuff, and I came across uh, Matt Basak, who had this revolutionary new method of getting leads, and it was called a squeeze page. And you, you, you capture people's email address by giving them something cool on it. And then you follow up with email. So that became my lead source for getting people to join my strength camps. And uh, it worked really well. Back then, you know, there was no competition in YouTube, mm -hmm. in Google. And also, uh, it was pretty revolutionary. Like, yeah, that was brand new stuff. Right. So, so people bid on it. You know, now you got to get more savvy and people expect more from you justifiably. Um, because, you know, good stuff in the bad hands always turns into scams. But, <laughs> right? But um, that's how I was able to get leads for my gym. And then I, uh, while studying internet marketing, I learned that, well, you can actually create digital products yeah. and kind of use the same method to sell your ideas. So I created a football work training workout. I created a, um, a holistic fitness program. I created a DVD of the month. I created all these various digital uh, information products yeah. that I delivered by gathering these leads. So, yeah. So, Ellie, who were some of your other marketing mentors? Well... There was there was Matt Basak, of course, which wasn't much of a mentor, meaning that like he just gave me the idea and I ran with it. Right. You know, after that, it was pretty you know we cut cut ties. I learned a lot from a woman named Stephanie Hartman. I don't know if she's even around anymore, mm -hmm. but she had like a a mastermind program uh, that I joined, and that was that was fairly helpful because it taught me about funnels and it taught me about upsells and and having a back end mm -hmm. and 
you know, all the various aspects of having a, a, a big information marketing business. And then I got into Dan Kennedy and pretty much, you know, I don't study that marketing that much more uh, any longer, but I stuck with him for a while and got uh, most of the best information mm -hmm. I needed. What's been, what was Tom Mitchell's influence on you? Tom taught me strongman. He taught me how to train with stones and, and flip tires. First time I met him, he, uh, I, I almost passed out and I loved it. <laughs> what what, what <laughs> were you doing? I was doing? in love. Well, coming from playing college, I've been on so many different ends of the spectrum. I kind of just bounce back and forth. Coming from college football and, and being, I was always like big, strong, and aggressive. I, I came, I, I let the pendulum swing all the way to the other end where I lost like 40 pounds and I was just doing corrective exercise and core strength. And, you know, I let a lot of my, uh, my power lifting strength go away. And I went to a seminar one day with this guy. He's like, 320 pounds. Uh, he's about six, six two, the, a beard and a big southern accent. I had just moved down here. And he's like, all right, boys, you see these kegs over here? And he had like a line of beer kegs. He's like, you're going to pick one at a time, carry it about 15 yards, bring it back, and then repeat with you know, one after another. I mean, it started out with like a 75 pound keg. And I'm like, hey, it's not so bad. I feel pretty good. By the time you get to the end, it's a 250 pound keg. And you're like, so uh, after that, he, t he took a giant tractor tire, tied a chain around it, and put a handle on it and, and had it at one end of the parking lot. And he's like, all right, boys, now drag this down to the other end of the parking lot. By the end, by the end of that, exercise my legs felt like they were going to explode and I laid on the floor for a good 10 15 minutes before I could even get up and even when I got up my legs were wobbling and like I said I instantly fell in love I was like this is what I'm supposed to <laughs> that's <laughs> hilarious like my legs were going to explode I thought I was going to collapse I fell in love <laughs> yeah <Yep. laughs> um what's the significance of the red chair Mike Westerdahl and the red chair. <laughs> you're funny. You picked up all these little weird things. Yeah, so uh, you're talking about the first time I went camping. So, uh, you know, even when I worked at the fitness gym, I always kept a carrot in front of me. I always said, like, when I worked at the fitness gym, my, the big carrot for me was I'm, I wanted to go to my mother-in-law's house in Maine. She lived in Maine, and it just, to me, it's not like paradise, you know. Of course, I live in paradise. I live in Florida. But I wanted the extreme opposite because it just, it would get me out of where I am. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, I, and I just dangled that carrot until, you know, finally I reached that goal. And it was like, that was going to be my first vacation. I'm going to treat myself for all this hard work, mm. working from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Right. I'm going to Maine, and I'm just going to chill. I'm going to relax. And... Um, I did the same thing when I started my own business, except it was, I want to go camping. I want to take my family camping. And we, uh, we bought a tent from Walmart that leaked when it rained and a, and a bunch of chairs. And the first time we set up camp, raccoons got into our car and ate up all our food. Sounds horrible. And yeah. I was lucky enough that he left the bottle of vodka there. <laughs> <laughs> So, so a good majority of the camping trip, I, if I sat in that red chair and, and guzzled vodka. I was like, "This is my vacation." Country music. <laughs> so, who's Mike Westerdahl? Mike is a friend who I first started developing internet product. Well, my most popular internet products with mm -hmm. because he had more marketing experience than me. So I had a football product, I had a holistic product, mm -hmm. and uh, Mike and I came up with a bodybuilding product because of course that's, you know, that will sell more. And he and I collaborated on creating lean hybrid muscle and we owned that business together for maybe about two years. And then uh, he continued on with Critical Bench, which is his website. And I continued on uh, with various other ventures. That mm -hmm. I it seems like with. there was significance with the Red Chair and Mike uh, about getting out of debt also, right? Or is that something? Some, well, getting out of debt, that's another story in itself. But, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I built a lot of my business on credit card. Like I said, I used the credit card to, sign, to, to pay my rent the first two months. And all that 
mentorship from Matt Basak and Stephanie Hartman and Dan Kennedy. That was, that was all credit cards. Um, there were times when the only way I could put gas in the van was with credit cards. We had to buy food on credit cards. So I got into a significant amount of debt. And when the money started coming in, yeah. uh, I realized, like, well, my first goal is to get out of this credit card debt. And we, I hired a company that uh, essentially goes out and they negotiate various lower rates for you to to uh, get out of. I think we were like in a hundred, almost a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. And I had to come up with something like two thousand dollars a month, which I didn't have, but we committed to. I said, I'm going to do this. And through you know, our efforts with Lean Hybrid Muscle and the gym and some other things, I was able to patch it together and, and get out of debt in about two years. Yeah, that's impressive. Because you yeah. hear about, you know, Elliot, people see you and they see millions of YouTube subscribers. They see you lifting weights in the gym and they don't see the 6 a.m. to 10 at night <laughs> days and they don't see that you put everything on a credit card to start and just did whatever it took, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it, I'm I'm enjoying this conversation because even I forget sometimes, you know those. Not to say that there were dark days, but you know once we get out of pain, we're not trying to get we're not trying to remember it. Right. You know, I I, I read a book once called The Science of Getting Rich, and he talks about as you to, to some degree he says like as you start uh, visualizing and realizing your goals. Don't talk about your bad days mm. because essentially you put yourself back into the frequency. Right. And I spent some time telling people what I did and where I came from, but I don't lament over them. Right. And uh, But I think I'm missing something by doing this because it's almost like don't forget where you come from. And uh, this conversation is helping me remember mm, where I, I came from. It. Damn, it was hard. So <laughs> <laughs> I think also people relate, rate, you know, relate to it. You know, and if they see, well, if he was able to do that, then I can too type mm -hmm. of mentality because they just see, you know, some people, you know, like you said, there, there's a lot of fans out there and they may put you on a pedestal of sorts and think you're superhuman and that you weren't maybe in the same situation they were at now, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's, and that's a Dan Kennedy uh, rule right there. He says, keep reminding people why you're who you are, why you are where you are, because they'll tend to forget. And I know there are a lot of people that somebody commented the other day and I was talking about, uh, I, I said, I made some comment about uh, lifestyle and these guys were like, uh, well, you, you've got the life, Elliot, essentially calling me lucky. He's like, look, you're just a YouTuber. You got the life. He's like, wait right. a second, motherfucker. You don't you <laughs> have no idea. Right? The struggle is real. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, you went through iterations, and I think what's interesting too is the evolution of your YouTube channel. Because I was reading one of the posts, and your wide and deep post I thought was powerful. Your wide and deep post were, I don't know if you were just not going to do any more YouTube videos, or was it you were just going to change directions with the YouTube channel? Because I, you know, you see all these posts all over. Elliot Hull stops YouTube videos. Elliot Hull stopped doing YouTube videos. So what was your thought process at that at that point? Just like with running full speed into 300 pound men so that you can tackle a ball carrier, I, I, I stopped thinking. And that's what it was. It was a matter of like, when I say thinking, it's, it's ego construct thinking. It's like believing in who you think you are, believing the stories you've been told, believing the stories other people tell you, believing in the reflection of yourself. So I had to literally just stop all the conversations that sound a lot like, oh my God, what will happen? What will people think? What, how, how will I make money? My whole business will collapse. Like all this fear-based garbage. And I, at one point, I, would just, I just had to say, I'm running through that brick wall. I'm running through those tacklers or, or blockers. And I just shut my brain off. And I, you know, I think there's a, there's a level of fear faith associated with it saying like it's going to be all right just like when i'm running full speed into into the into the blockers it's like i'm not going to think about what could potentially go bad because i'm going through that guy right and when i i stopped making videos it was it was more difficult than running through someone because it was a passive choice rather than an active choice and all i my whole life has been a matter of active choices this was the first time where i quit 
And that was just as hard, maybe harder, because it goes against my natural inclination to attack. Yeah. But that's yeah. what was killing me was I was being a hero again. And I'm human. And you need to take a break. So it was just you just needed a break type of thing? Yeah. Uh, uh, if I was going to remain integrous to my message, and mm -hmm. I've made videos over and over again about honoring your body, listening to your heart, yeah. also that life happens in seasons, and you know there are times that you, you, got, you have to allow the energy to recede like the winter so that you could come back strong in the spring. Right. And I, you know, I share all these ideas with young people in order to, to give them life lessons that allow them to grow stronger, and here I am not listening to my own advice yeah. because I'm a slave to what I think they're going to think. Right. And I had to do the thing in order to actually embody it and, and, and have integrity, you know? Yeah. I don't know how you did it. I do not know how you did that, actually. That had to be one of the toughest things to do, actually. You know, you're getting tons of traction. You know, you're doing what you love to do. But it's, I guess it was just the time where you need a break. When did you know it was time to, to restart again? Well, I had I'd seen it coming for a while. I think January of 2014, like, I, you, you know, there's that still small voice that speaks, whispers in your ear, and you could listen to it or you could ignore it. Well, the still small voice was whispering, and I was like, get out of here. So, was that Colleen, the small voice? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, she... <laughs> She uh she was almost as shocked as I was, but again she supports she supports me so much and uh, she was very helpful during the process and because she's watched enough Yo Elliot videos <laughs> because she and I are kind of on the same frequency right. she knew that it was just a season and she was like all right well you need a break and that's okay and if you come back great if you don't come back that's fine just give yourself space yeah. and that's really what I that's really what I needed so when did you know it was ready to come back. Again, you feel it, man. It's like again, tur <sighs> turning your brain off. It, it sounds so strange, but it really is the it has been the guiding yeah. principle of of getting me where I am, listening to my intuition rather than my logic. And for all logical intents and purposes, I could have created a strategy for coming back. Yeah. But I just woke up one day and and I started feeling like. I want to make some videos. I feel like making the some passion videos. passion came back, yeah. Yeah, you know, it wasn't that simple. I had a little urging on by, you know, I needed to make some videos to speak to some people about various mm. things. I had, I had customers that needed to hear from me, yeah. so I had to fulfill that obligation. But it kind of got the ball rolling a little bit. And I was like, hey, I like this. This is cool. I, all right, I'm, I'm ready. Let's go back. Yeah, yeah. The, so the turning your brain off, you know, I'm wondering what's going inside, you know, going on inside your brain when you turn your brain off and you're lifting a 400 pound piece of equipment. Because I remember I was talking to a gold medal winner, Olympic athlete, and they said when they jump off to swim, they're not thinking, but they're at all. They're just thinking, you know, just simple things like just stroke, just stroke, just, you know, what there's just a repeating thing going on inside their head. What's that for you? Do you have something like that when you're in one of these these competitions that is just repeating your head or you're going full speed to just to destroy the wedge. <laughs> what are you thinking? Well, maybe more applicable to the conversation we're having right now yeah. is, is how I get on with the work that I'm supposed to do. And I just say to myself, do it anyway, do it anyway, do it anyway, shut up and do it anyway. My dad is another one. It's another Edmund Hulse. Classic was you got to be a robot. He says you. Just, no, he said machine, not robot. He says you got to be a machine. Just be a machine. A mm -hmm. machine does not think about what he has to do. He just does it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You get up. You don't feel like doing it. You do it. Yeah. You get up and it's raining outside. You do it. Yeah. You get up and you don't want to do it. You do it. Yeah. And I would just say to I just say to myself, just do it anyway. Do it anyway. I've made some really bad videos because I'm just doing it anyway. Right. You know, I put it out there anyway. Just keep going. Yeah. Maybe the title of your next best-selling book, Be a Machine. Who knows? Um, so I, I have to ask this question. Obviously, I, I like the conversation talking about wife, kids, men, you know, mental toughness. But you know, I get destroyed by, by people if I don't ask this about building a community in, in, on YouTube and what were some of the big 
um, things you did to create those huge jumps in subscribers? Well, it, it sounds cliche and everybody says this, but it's not always the easiest thing to do for a lot of people, but it's mm -hmm. just to be authentic, mm -hmm. to be completely you. You know, when I get in front of the camera, I my objective is not to put on anything, but to take off as much as possible. And, uh, and I know I'm doing that when I'm breathing freely and fully. So I get close to the camera. I try to be as intimate as possible. I ask questions that are really earthy, that really have to do with day-to-day -day life, that really have to do with the boots on the ground stuff that many uh, of my readers and subscribers are dealing with rather than the one that uh, search engines like or mm -hmm. the one that's the you know the, the buzzfeed is gonna is gonna love you know I yeah. try to give my I try to put good headlines but essentially I'm answering questions that yeah. uh, like Eminem says you you know I, I only rap I rap about the things that you only talk with your friends in the living room about you know I'm, I'm gonna rap about the things that you you and your friends thought nobody else was thinking about because you guys are just talking about it in the living room, mm -hmm. you know, late at night after drinking some 40 ounces and you think like, man, if anybody heard this conversation, they think we're weird. Well, I'm willing to talk to you about that stuff mm -hmm. because it's real. Yeah. yeah. What were some of those turning point videos for you that you remember you, your authentic self did come out and it just really hit home with your audience. They caused, whether it was more viewers or someone spread the word on it. It's funny because my more... It doesn't always line up with video popularity. Hmm. You know, some of my yeah. favorite videos aren't the ones that were really popular right. because, you know, maybe they're kind of uh, left field topics. But I, I judge myself by my authenticity in the video. It's not always like giving the best answer or having the right answer, but hmm. did it come from my heart? Do I, did I really mean what I was saying? Right rather than I'm trying to come up with something to say. Right. And those ones I yeah. always give myself a, a pat on the back for. Yeah, yeah. I'm smiling because uh, one, of your, one of your answers to one of the videos was just, I can't believe you said it. It was someone asked you one of the most embarrassing things that happened. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, and I said uh, premature ejaculation. <laughs> <laughs> you said... But it was with your wife, the first time with your wife or something. I go, I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I know. It, it gets me in trouble sometimes, oh, man. man. I, I, I think a part of growing up and, and being less hero and more warrior is being a bit more mindful about what I'm willing to say because there are feelings at stake. You know, I don't want to embarrass my wife. Or right. Well, that doesn't children. embarrass her. That That is like... Uh, a testimonial to her beauty or whatever else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how good she is down there, right? <laughs> right so, um, so, Elliot, since this inspired insider, I always ask the question, um, what's been the lowest point in your life and how you push through? Uh, let me hit this do not disturb. Because I keep... Well, I, I got to say that... I'm like I'm... crying from that last one. I'm sorry. Like that was... <laughs> Hey, man, I think we've all been there at one point at least. I don't think we all start out. Exactly. Like, uh, like Jeremy. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I think I just emerged from a pretty dark place. Just you now, know? you mean? Recently? Yeah, the, the past eight months that, uh, that I took in order to recover and regroup so that I can reemerge. Um, in, in doing my work, you know, resurrecting and showing up again on YouTube, uh, look one thing to the viewer. But for me, it's been a matter of, okay, do, am I ready to do my work? Because this is my work. You know, it's, it's not a hobby. It's my profession. You know, and, and, for, and, and for anybody to live their life not being able to fulfill their vocation or their calling is a, is a painful thing. So... It was a it was a pretty I say dark in that I wasn't you know I wasn't wallowing in my own disgust, but I didn't feel fully embodied uh, and I didn't feel integrous. I didn't feel myself, and really it was a deconstruction of ego that uh, that's a difficult thing, you know to 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 believe you're one thing and then have a sledgehammer come and destroy it completely is is 
shattering. You know, it's 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 I don't want to say life shattering, but it, it's it's a shattering of the psyche. Yeah. So it, it took me some time to figure out where I want to go, who I want to be, and what it's going to take to 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 do that work, to do my work in a sustainable way. Yeah. You know, part of the problem was that I, again, I was going balls to the wall like I always do, and mm. burnt myself out. And I had to decide, can I do this work without burning myself out? Yeah. And I had to look at how is that going to happen. If you notice my videos, I still make Yo Elliot videos. I enjoy doing them, and you know, I grow more and more animated as I get more practice since taking off so much time. Yeah. But my my videos on my Strength Camp channel, I'm not trying to prove myself with the amount of weight I lift anymore. I'm not trying to prove mm-hmm. how much of a beast I am, which is you know what attracted people to the channel. Yeah. I work out with my wife, and sometimes my son Benjamin shows up. Yeah, I saw. I was watching one today. Yeah, he's like hanging on the bar. You're like just counting how long he could hang there for. Yeah, it's just a regular yeah. workout. It's like a regular workout with Elliot. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm not trying to prove anything. If you like, if you enjoy my presence and my company, I'm here for you. I'm not trying to to entertain you in any great way. Uh, I want to do my work in a sustainable fashion, and that means I enjoy working out and I enjoy having you here while I work out, and that's going to be it. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. It's interesting because it could have been, you know, three months. It could have been eight months. It could have been three years, right? So, what was the? Do you think the biggest thing that you needed to break through during that eight months that allowed you to just okay, I can do this and not burn myself out or kill myself with this? To give my permission not to be. (laughs) <laughs> it's going to sound weird, but give myself permission not to be awesome. I think that the, the, I, it, it's always a matter of doing big, better, more, mm-hmm. more extravagant. I, I, I've watched a lot of people in my industry, one who, who was killed, rest in peace, mm-hmm. uh, trying to do more and more bigger, better, more extravagant, more grandiose presentations You know, to entertain an audience that's hungry. I mean, they, because with YouTube, it's not like, you know, you show up once a week like American Idol, or, well, that's like two, three times a week, but like TV shows where they show up once a week, it's, you can show up all day, every day if you want to, and yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a road to burnout. So giving myself permission to be small, giving myself permission just to make good enough videos that are comfortable enough for me to make, because I feel like making them, and be good enough with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So on the flip side, Elliot, what's been one of the proudest moments? Proudest moments of my life? Yeah. You know, it was, I set a lot of goals early on in my career, and one of them was to live in a particular neighborhood in, uh, in St. Petersburg, because you know it was a new city to me. I grew up in Long Island. Yeah. And when I came down here, one of my clients showed me around and he, she, she showed me various neighborhoods. And there was one neighborhood that had a lot of oak trees that reminded me of back home in Long Island. And I was yeah. like, because it, it, it's all palm trees here. Kind of get sickening, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they look like weeds after a while. <laughs> so I was like, man, I, I want to live in this neighborhood. And I remember, I remember being really down one day, just not, not feeling the best because you know, I was struggling. And driving Colleen's, the car we shared, which was a little white Ford Escort, through the neighborhood whenever I felt down and just looking at the houses and saying, I'm going to live here one day. And I'd park in one, of a ho- one house and I'd visualize myself walking up to the door and that's going to be my house one day. And that must have been seven, eight years ago. And I live in that neighborhood now. And I have a nice house on a nice block. And the day that I was able to afford that for my wife and, and my yeah. children, I, at that point, there was just one child. Now there's four. And, and I have a big enough house and pool for them to enjoy themselves. I felt really proud of myself. Yeah, yeah I, I, was, I was amazed at how goal setting and visualization really works. Just in awe. And also proud that, man, I, I can do this. If I can do this, I can do anything. Yeah. I mean, I remember that, that is truly amazing. And one of the things that touched me with one of your videos was um, you have a lot of fans and you touch them and, and millions of people, essentially. 
Um, and you've had notes of people like suicide, attempted to, or not attempted, but, but people who, um, I don't know if they emailed or, or called in, but um, what was one of those where you actually literally helped change someone's, the course of their life? Do you remember any of those? It's, 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 uh, it's, this is going to sound strange again, but it's too big for me to really understand and to know. Yeah. Because when we make these videos, when you make this podcast, you don't know who's listening and where they are in their right. life at this particular moment. Right. And what you say at that particular moment that might revolutionize their life. Right. And there's a lot of those. Yeah. You know, the more people that are exposed to what you're saying, the more people, something you share changes everything for them yeah. you know i remember listening to to alan watts like when i was in high school and and the his words literally took my brain and turned it around in my skull yeah. but he's dead long gone and whoever uploaded those videos to napster probably has no idea that that changed my life right so i'll get emails every once in a while uh that my either my assistant or customer service will pass through and they'll say hey this is a good one and it'll be like someone who's like on the verge of doing something that uh, may have been irreversible yeah and something i said in a video changed their life and it changed their decision made allowed them to make a decision and and it's a tough thing to to accept and realize or, or receive as the individual who makes the content because it's like I never really set out to do that and I don't know what I said yeah. and I don't even think what I said is probably that important to me but it did something for someone else and right. that's part of the reason why I think it's important to just keep doing your work because you don't know who you're affecting yeah. at that particular time the other part of it is trying to remain detached because I look at it less as less of Elliot Hull saved your life rather than the the right piece of information was shared with you at the right time when you needed it. Right. I really believe in the law of attraction and I really believe that if if your true self wants you to live, it's going to give you the thing that 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 spurs you into action for life. It wasn't right. me. It wasn't Elliot Hulse. It was you wanting to hear that piece of information and right. coming to you because of that desire. Yeah. yeah. Elliot, I really appreciate your time and um I know we're right uh, after the hour. Where should we? I have one last question, but where should we point people towards? Where should they check you out? Oh man, I I, I love social media. Of course, I have ElliotHulse.com, which is my website, mm -hmm. and I don't update it nearly as much. I got some events that aren't even posted on there. But if you go to my Facebook wall, you, you'll you'll catch me. If you go to YouTube, of course, I've got my two channels: Elliot Hulse and Strength Camp. Uh, I make Snapchats now, so if you want to. Catch me on Snapchat, it's Elliot Hulse, or Instagram, it's Elliot Hulse. So yeah. I'm all over the place. I think yeah. that's the way it is these days, right? Yeah, yeah. So my last question, I want to thank your wife, Colleen, for helping set this up. Also, Matt Gallant for raving about you and telling me um, you need to, to talk to Elliot. And um, my last question is, who are three people you want to train? I mean, you do tons of training. Who are three people you want to, if you could pick anyone? Who Man, you want to have come in and train? Who I would like to train with? With or, I, yeah, with well, or train, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm going to tell you who I want to train with. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's We're going to get them. Let's get them. Go ahead. Oh, man, I'd love to train with The Rock. Dwayne Johnson, man, he's so damn cool. I watch his uh, his, his uh, Instagram videos and some of the mashups on, on YouTube, and I used to love him when I used to watch WWE. Man, the guy is so, he's so jacked. But he's also good looking with a smile and he's so animated. He's just, uh, he, he's my man crush, I guess. Okay, okay. <laughs> Anyone else? The Rock? I, who, who else you want to train really, with? Or that's train? really all I've been thinking. Uh, I'd have to really think about it if there was anybody else. But um, yeah, yeah, The Rock, yeah. that's it. All right. So if we get you the rock, then can I come and train with you? Or, or what? Oh, hell yeah. Of okay. course. <laughs> There's no way in hell I can lift one of those boulders. <laughs> but I'll try. I'll try. Um, no, Elliot, thank you so much. People, There's so many things people need to check out um, on your, your videos. And I almost bought you a domain name before we got on because it just hit me. You know, you're like the fitness philosopher. <laughs> um, it was $2,100. So I'm like, oh, I'll let him buy it if he wants it. But um, 
but it is available. So, but Elliot, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Take care, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.